starts. Uh, Berkun, everyone, uh, here at Pinale, Milano, for a seminar of this afternoon. Uh, next time, we will put just a few words to introduce the afternoon, and I will leave the floor to you. Uh, I will leave here. Um, just to say that um, well, this seminar is a joint event. Uh, this is um, part of the teaching program of the, uh, of the course uh, about certain objectives and potential of heritage, a graphic school of the landscape and heritage <coughs> pertaining to the Dano. And uh, for the students of the Architectural Preservation Studio for the Master Program, uh, are invited to the seminar, so it's a jointly occasion. Um, and more, this seminar is a star for a series of seminars dedicated to uh, oh, yes, okay. Soviet modernism, uh, a series of seminars which have been curated with stories of appropriation and engagement. It is a series of seminars curated by Professor Boris Tukovic, which is here with me. Professor Tukovic is an independent researcher and also an activist, which is why we have been struggling for years for protecting and uh, to raise the awareness about the uh, modernist heritage in Central Asia, especially in Pakistan and the part of Tashkent, and he is now guest of Politecnico, is spending a semester here as a visiting researcher, so a very good occasion to have him with us today. Uh, and this series of seminar is dealing with uh, the task, the issue of managing the relevant legacy of uh, Soviet modernism in different countries, uh, once belonging to the USSR galaxy. So we are a very number of students, and the two of them are here today, uh, thanks to the intervention of uh, uh, Nini Palamardini, I'm oh, sorry for the back pronunciation of the surname, and Ruben Alvestayan. Uh, mistake, but I don't want to guess what you mean. Uh, which are going to present two brilliant experiences uh, in which the task of managing Soviet modernism is both scattered with the intervention and support of an international, or which to say, US based agency, at least the Yankee Foundation, uh, within an international program named Keep It Modern, which had a number of group of researchers and activists on the ground floor to make action for protecting this kind of heritage by drafting of the conservation management plan, which is something that our guest will be straight back to me in the bar. And before letting the floor to Professor Jacobi, <coughs> just to thank to architect Katarina Gorbati, which is the, the very leader of all of this initiative regarding the study in Tashkent, uh, in the field of research, of which this exposi exposition represents a uh, preview of the early result. And uh, it is the result of the collaboration between uh, her and his firm, which is named Grace. He is an architectural studio based in Milano, between us and the Technical Department of Architecture and Women's Studies, a group which is made by me, by Sophia Chelly, you already know, by Federica Bill, which is here, and Professor Andrei for Luis Dukovic and the Laboratorio Permanente, which is another uh, quite brilliant field in Milan for architecture and urbanism. And this group collaborated, have been collaborating since uh, uh, for one year and a half, two years nearly, in this part in discovering and uh, um, which on the light onto this huge collection of buildings. Uh, in Tashkent, which if you, uh, if you will, you, you have the chance to, um, to visit thanks to the exposition after the seminar and the video that Katya will join us in 
because I think that we did so far. So I thought too much, and so before this, there is for introducing a second. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, all guys that will be here, uh, and they created our link. And um, how was it done? Uh, okay. uh, so our seminar got uh, the in the frame of this exhibition, commissioned by the Foundation of uh, Development Art and Culture, the Pagan Fund. Um, and uh, jointly with uh, the department uh, the and the student line, uh, I take the seminar, uh, and jointly with the great studio um, by, by a technology and the uh, and um, <coughs> So, uh, the uh, logic is here. Uh, why uh, our seminar uh, focus on touching the uh, first But uh, in order to decentralize our view uh, on fluid uh, modernism in general, we would like to uh, show you uh, different phases uh, of this modern architecture which appear in different parts of the Soviet Union. Our seminar um, has already uh, covered a different presentation concerning the Lithuania, so about countries. We will uh, present also another seminar with Ukraine, which is uh, absolutely uh, necessary to uh, in our time. But uh, today we have uh, uh, two presentations uh, uh, from Asian uh, Republic. Uh, Armenia and Georgia, uh, Georgia, sorry, uh, uh, Armenia and Georgia. Uh, and uh, as for Armenia, we have an absolutely um, uh, 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 important figure for uh, architecture and art in, uh, uh, of this uh, state, uh, Ruben Arishatan, who um, is a uh, Art creator, uh, historian of art architecture, and uh, the uh, professional who worked in museology. Uh, he um, occupies a different uh, position uh, during his uh, career, professional career, since the, um, since, uh, the beginning of 2000. He worked uh, as a co founder and cultural director of the Institute. Contemporary art at uh, Yeva. Also, um, he was uh, uh, for some time uh, a uh, director of uh, the National Museum of Architecture uh, of Armenia. Um, he was uh, since uh, he visited in the Zonon's Guggenheim Museum in New York, uh, he was the author uh, of numerous uh, uh, very important exhibitions on contemporary art and architecture in different uh, uh, cities like uh, as, uh, Sao Paulo, Venice, uh, Vienna, um, uh, Yerevan, uh, Kiev, and in many, many other cities. Um, now, uh, Ruben is the uh, director of the Institute of Contemporary uh, for Contemporary Art in Yerevan. And uh, uh, so uh, maybe it's a moment to invite him. Uh, it's a honor for us uh, to be with you, Ruben, and, uh, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Boris, for introduction. Just uh, one correction. I'm not the director of the Institute for Contemporary Art. I'm the co-founder. Um, uh, so uh, I, as the time is quite tight and the material is too big, I will switch immediately to the lecture. Okay, uh, so uh, my presentation is going to be divided in two parts. The first part calls Conflicting Modernities in Soviet Armenian Architecture. 
And the second part, uh, which I hope that I will succeed in terms of time, is going to be about uh, the project uh, of developing the conservation management plan of Seven Writers Resort. So, first part, conflicting modernities in Soviet Armenian architecture. So, here you can see the cover of the leaflet uh, of the uh, Armenian National Pavilion in 14th uh, International Architecture of Biennale in Venice. And here you can see the poster of the pavilion the capital of desires called uh, our project. I was uh, the curator together with my uh, friend and colleague, Yorg Sholhama, with whom we uh, curated, led, and put together many exhibitions, led many researches, like Sweet Sixties, quite an important research. Uh, what was about our pavilion? Our pavilion was telling about like the architecture of Armenia in 20th century, mostly like the Soviet period, focused on the Soviet period. But the story was not only about the architecture because uh, we were considering the architecture as a specific kind of like the media through which uh, much broader visions about how the nation, how the society should be organized. And in Armenian case in the 20th century, it was like the very specific moment because uh, in the very beginning of 2000s, Armenia, as many other nations, like the end of 19th century and the beginning of uh, 20th century, started the fight for uh, independence. It was like the big decolonizing like the movement going on in Europe. And uh, in the beginning of 2000s, uh, in the beginning of uh, uh, 20th century, Armenia uh, uh, gained its independence and uh, it was also like the historical chance to reestablish its uh, lost statehood and build new nation state. So architecture in that terms became a very strong like the ide ideological instrument. So here you can see some views of the our pavilion uh, but at the same time the as the visions concerning the future of the nation state and the future about like the how the society should be built of course uh, the uh, in architecture this ambiguity also found its uh, manifestation. So I would start with the story which is uh, strangely not connected to the uh, architectural field but with the literature because it was 2017 when uh, first time after uh, 1931 uh, the novel of uh, by that, but till 2007, not very much well known Armenian writer Makartich Armen has been republished because in 1931 the novel called Yerevan came out and then it was banned. The, that novel was banned for almost, almost a century and it was uh, a very uh, important, extremely interesting. I would say brilliant surrealistic novel uh, where the story uh, is about architects, how the architects envision actually new, new city, new capital. And they are dealing with the dilemmas actually to keep the old city, to ruin it, what is worth it to keep, an um, interesting thing that I mean, this uh, discussions, very hard disputes goes between like the 
two uh, architects and one uh, proposes like the, let's say, uh, the new approaches in the architectural ur urban planning. The other is one more conserv uh, conservative. Uh, in his approaches, but on one uh, at one point they are quite of like the agree they should get rid of like the 19th century colonial architecture, which was like the architecture created during the Russian Empire. Very interesting because now this architecture is considered as the most worthy one. However, now I would like to switch. So uh, concerning the novel, what is the interesting thing? Uh, because uh, in the architectural professional communities, specifically in the post-Soviet period, it was being considered that the discourse, the theoretical discourse actually did not uh, exist. It was much more kind of like the practical uh, profession uh, dealing with this trend or the other, though the architects were considering themselves as like the great masters, like the producing like the brilliant examples of uh, like the uh, architecture of these or that specific periods of time. But anyhow, I mean, to go deep inside the theoretical background and just to think about that there was like the public discourse or professional discourse about it, this, this topic is still quite uh, 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 problematic, even in the professional communities. However, the novel proves that the discourse existed and now I'm switching towards like the story about the architects and here you can see like two important architects, Alexander Tamanyan. Can you see my uh, mouse on the screen? And Torosto Romanyan. Torosto Romanyan was an architecture and art uh, architecture and architecture historian and he started the researches of like the medieval Armenian architecture uh, in the very beginning of 20th century. And uh, he was uh, like the very much inspired by the uh, ideas of like the Josef Storzhikovsky, uh, uh, Nikolai Osmar, and uh, the expeditions that Toros Toramanian was leading specifically in the uh, such an important city like Ani, which was the capital of uh, medieval Armenian kingdom, this uh, expedition became a certain kind of like a mecca for uh, not only architects who were joining uh, Toramanian to help him and to uh, participate in his uh, researches, but also for intellectuals who were coming from Russian centers, from Armenia, uh, to see how the history was coming out. And Alexander Tamanyan was one of the architects who were inspired by the activity of Toramanyan. And in 2019, Alexander Tamanyan moved from uh, Russia to newly established First Republic of Armenia uh, as one of many other intellectuals uh, and just people who were like the believing uh, uh, in Armenian communities in uh, different countries. They started to move back to Armenia and uh, uh, continued their professional, uh, professional career there. Then in 2000, so he worked in independent Armenia just for a year. Then there was the Sovietization in 2020 and in 2021, I, an extreme terror that started in newly uh, Sovieticized Armenia uh, forced many people, including Alexander Tamanyan, to run. And he escaped to uh, Persia 
for uh, several years he worked in uh, Tavriz. And in 2023, Alexander Tamanyan moving back to Armenia and he actually... You said that all this in 2019, sorry. Sorry, 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 sorry. 1923. <laughs> it's always this confusion between the centuries and millennia. 1923. 1923. He's moving back to Yerevan. And actually, in 2024, the first master plan of Yerevan that he has proposed was actually the continuation of the project that he developed during the independent Armenia. So let's consider, and this is not only my opinion, it was also opinion of many art historians, architecture historians, also architecture historian like Karen Badian. So the master plan and actually the visions of a new uh, capital of uh, independent Armenia was actually product of the first republic which found actually its materialization realization during the Soviet Armenia. Tamanyan's principles were based on the 19th century neoclassicist, uh, Russian neoclassicist uh, school and historicist actually visions where he inspired by the ideas of Toros Toromanyan, the same Stashigovsky, the same uh, Nikola Yosmar, he um, uh, suggested a uh, quite interesting, I mean, but at the same time, well-known in the 19th century European architecture approach to combine the uh, technologies, new uh, constructive technologies uh, with the historicist, uh, uh, with the historical uh, background of the region where he was building, uh, where he was like the realizing his constructions. But the major political aspect of that, uh, of that approach was just to find in the to fill the historical gap of the social political cultural and historical actually interruption that had happened to the nation and uh, as a uh, interrupting point uh, tamanyan considered like the medieval uh, medieval period and uh, from the medieval period what he has depicted was like the cleric architecture the church architecture specifically focusing on the researches of Toramanyan and uh, that he was doing in Ani also the researches which were like the, he was realizing in Tekor in Finn uh, coming back to this image, please keep in mind, I mean, the structure here, you can see like the, the project uh, of Alexander Tamanyan of the Iver Lake uh, electric substation. But this is an important image because soon I'm going to make the reference on it. Here you can see the uh, governmental, the, uh, the the governmental, the project of the governmental house that was designed in 1926, but the realization of the of the building only was completed in 1952 because the uh, interesting part of that that. Tamanyan is being considered as a founder of, so to say, like a new national school. But uh, one part of the history of that period was skipped out, and um, uh, and it's actually about the other the other uh, school or the other. Uh, circle of the architects who were like the working parallel in the same period of time and were opposing to the visions of Alexander Tamanyan. Uh, 
But the thing is that, that the appreciation of Tamanyan was quite, uh, quite uh, ambig ambiguous. Uh, not, uh, he was not being like the accepted, uh, like the fully by the professional community uh, in his own time. I mean, some people were like they're really admiring him, but for some uh, of his colleagues, uh, he was really outdated in his principles and ideas. But the other important thing is that, that I mean, in the, po the political appreciation, what Tamanyan was doing was also quite ambitious. At a certain part, he was well accepted. Then uh, he was being considered as like the nationalist during the Stalin period, but then, interestingly, later on, uh, he had been really canonized by the Stalinist uh, architecture, new school, uh, not only in the uh, scope of like the in the, the uh, context of like the Armenia, but also he was being brought as a kind of like an example of the architect who found really interesting the synthesis of national form and the socialist content. So be becoming in a way kind of like an exemplary architect representing like the principles of uh, socialist socialist realist architect socialist uh, architecture style of the stalinist period and in 1944 the building which was being considered for a certain period as quite an ambiguous even being considered as like the representation of like the nationalism in architecture it was awarded stalinist price in 1944 Here you can see uh, another important building that uh, Tamanyan had designed. It was the People's House, which was later uh, turned into the Academic Theatre and Opera and Ballet. Uh, designed in 1926, realized uh, in 1936, where you can see the also in this in uh, first project like the evolution from the neoclassicism to the implementation of different uh, elements taken from like a medieval architecture medieval armenian architecture and all the compositional principles the uh, sense of volume uh, it was also coming up in a way, from the researches uh, of like the uh, medieval architectural period, specifically dealing with the cleric architecture. And here, we're coming to like the shifting moments. Uh, here you can see uh, the flyer and flyer invitation card to the lecture discussion called The Course of Our Architecture by Mikhail Masmanian. It's 1928. 1928. And the architect uh, has just returned. Mikhail Masmanian just returned from Russia, uh, from Moscow. The graduate of Kutemas. Uh, we'll show you the photo and the photo of his colleagues a bit later, but Please, uh, I would like to invite your attention uh, beyond the, what is written here on the images. Here on the right side, you can see one of the one of the project proposals of uh, the People's House, and here you can see by Alexander Tamanyan, and here you can see the. Uh, comparisons that Mikhail Masmanian gives here, like here you see the uh, roof, the cupola. here you can see <coughs> other <coughs> buildings which were designed 
uh, previously, having almost the same uh, kind of like the compositional structure. And in the bottom, you can see how Mikhail Masmanian making a comparison with the conic cowl of like the celibate Armenian clergies. And in the text, he's directly just uh, making uh, the comparison of, so to say, from his per perspective, like the new national Armenian architectural style with the feudalic, cleric feudalic culture. And from here, I would like to go further. Here you can see Mikhail Mazmanyan. The photo was made in 1920s, who studied in Futemas, and Futein was the student of Ladovsky. And here you can also see his close friends, colleagues, <laughs> Gebor Kochar. <laughs> On the background, <clears throat> there is also, sorry. On the background, there is also Garo Halapan. <clears throat> and <clears throat> on the left side, you can see also Georgi Kruzikov, a famous architect who was designing flying cities. So they were from the same, uh, studying the same time. And the interesting thing, what uh, is in the photo, they are sitting next to the poster that they have just designed. Long live October in architecture. The interesting thing about this photo, that till today, this photo hasn't been published. I mean, I used it several times in my exhibitions, uh, but uh, in the Soviet architecture books, this photo was absent, though you can consider that it's kind of like the most emblematic image that could show like the, the relation of the young Armenian architects to the Soviet culture. But the books were written during the Stalinist period or later. And the attitude towards the revolutionary architecture by that time already had radically changed. These three architects actually founded the new circle uh, or like the new, so let's put it like that, the, the school uh, together with the uh, architects, uh, the alumni of the uh, architectural university that was founded in Armenia in uh, mid-1920s. And uh, here you can see the projects that they were proposing. This is like the first communa house in Armenia, in who designed for for uh, the house for workers of mechanical factory in Yerevan. Architects Garo Halaban and Mikhail Rosmanyan. Here you can see the construction workers club in Yerevan, Garo Halaban, Gevor Kochar, Mikhail Mazmanyan, like this tri uh, triad of the architects, close friends. Here you can see the master plan of the residential districts for the workers of synthetic rubber factory still exists in a very bad shape, but still exists. And uh, now coming back to their ideas about like the national, what is the national architecture? The uh, important thing is that that while they were like the criticizing Alexander Tamanyan in the um, uh, like the direct uh, implementations as replica, like the medieval architecture as like. Uh, just a reference. So they were saying that this architecture is completely fake and it's like the, because it is like the taken from completely other social economical and social political context. And it's uh, uh, not a correct, I would put it in a very correct way, not a correct way just to 
take the fragments, just the fragments of like the architecture that was uh, generated in specifically other socio-economic, socio-political context, and in an absolutely new socio-political context to name it as a new national architecture. As a national architecture, their approach was uh, focused on the class aspect of the architecture for whom this architecture was designed. So they were considering that the new architecture should be uh, in its so social fu function oriented to the working class. And as uh, like the predecessors of the working class, they were considering like the, the class, the exploited class and where this exploited class was living in the vernacular architecture. So it was not a cladic architecture. These were not the palaces or the ruins of palaces, but that was the existing vernacular architecture of Yerevan. Quite simple, here you can see an example of the vernacular architecture in the city made either from stone or made from like the, uh, like the bricks. And here you can see how they implemented actually the form in the project of the residential building, for instance, like this. The other important thing here, you can see another uh, example how uh, like the, the, the same uh, formal solution was implemented in the building of like the, the residential building for workers of Yerevan hydroelectric plant. But the important thing is that that uh, they were not just uh, taking the form as it is. Their major, I mean, these architects was, were writing a lot. There are very interesting texts that they have written. And one of the uh, things that they were like the observations about like the national architecture and the vernacular architecture is the exploration of how the space was organized. The space for the specific class, uh, how the specific class was organizing is living. The uh, and how functionally the space was organized. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, the other uh, technique of space organization, which was also quite common for like the region, not only for Armenia but also for Georgia, any other uh, like the culture or context which like the lives in the mountains. Uh, the terrace type buildings where the roof of one building can serve as a yard for the building which is above it and thus we can see like that the roof turned into a yard is becoming a common space for uh, the uh, families which were living under the roof and for the uh, families who are living in front of the yard. So the space which can provide uh, uh, the, uh, which has a potentiality of creating like the new forms of sociality. Here you can see the, uh, the project for the, housing development for the city of Kapan. They did not succeed to realize this project uh, in, in 20s and 30s, but the same principle was used for the same city to uh, realize the development in the 70s. The, uh, actually, this story deals because also with the, uh, with the subject of like the Sevan, that is why I'm just uh, stopping on it. But I mean, here you can see the projects of the architects, different other architects, but this is also already the period how the transformation started to, uh, to happen in the uh, period between 1932 and 1937, 36, 37, when 
the uh, avant-garde was gradually turning into uh, like the new style, which would later be named as a Stalinist one. But this is like the transitional moment. The project of another architect, Tobanes Malkarian. Here you can see another project in the transitory state designed in one way, but uh, completed in completely other way. And here you can see also the uh, projects of late projects of Kochar, Gevor Kochar. And this is the, I would say, one of the last buildings of Kochar, the, uh, the uh, building, that the administrative building of the NKVD or KGB, which Kochar had designed, like the, you could see, it's like the pure constructivist construction, like the built in stone. And the ironic thing that uh, in the same building in 1937, Kochar and Mazmanyan were imprisoned for a certain period of time. And this is the last project of Mikhail Mazmanyan and Tovanes Markaran. In 1937, both architects, the, Mikhail Mazmanyan and Gevor Kochar, were arrested and sent to uh, Siberia. But Consider talking about the very last project of Gevor Kochar, I would like to invite your attention on this building. This is like the wine cellars of Ararat Trust. He did it together with the architect of a younger generation, Rafael Israelian, uh, the story about whom will come up later. It's an important architect. So, uh, you can see that, I mean, the character of the building is also completely, I mean, in the same logic, but I mean, it's really distinct. It's really distinct, talking about like the national forms, but uh, again, the reference towards historicism, but at the same time, it's a bit different and about difference I will tell later. Okay, another, in uh, the building, which was designed by the same architect, Rafael Israelian. He was not exiled, he was young. He was like, the, he continued his career uh, during the Stalinist period. And in 1944, when the war was still not over, he was already commissioned to uh, design the monument of the victory, the museum of the victory in the World War II, or Patriotic War, as it was called. So the museum was topped with the huge monument of Stalin. And here you can see the transformation that had happened with the same building. The monument was replaced. Mother came to uh, substitute father. But in terms of like the, uh, so to say, the attitudes <laughs> and the intentions, uh, I would say the difference was minor. From here, I'm going to switch the periods. Uh, the switch the periods about this transformation. You can find my text uh, online called Blank Zones in the Collective Memory. You just can Google and find it. It will tell you a lot about the transformations, not only in Armenia, but it tells partly something also about like the Georgian uh, situation. And, the general situation, the, the, the logic of the transition. But Stalinist epoch. So we're jumping this period, over this period, and uh, going to 1955. 1955, uh, uh, the year when uh, many of the imprisoned architects were not only architects, people, uh, during that under the Stalinist repressions, they were rehabilitated and got back. So among them were Mikhail Mazmanyan and Kochar. So here you can see how after getting back to Armenia, Mikhail Mazmanyan actively uh, integrated into the professional uh, community and the activities. And 
his major uh, so involvement was in the urban planning. And this is like the a master plan of the Chapkanth residential district, which complete, uh, which has a direct connection to the crucial politics of like the mass housing. And these are like the examples of the local development of like the mass housing. Uh, the architect Samuel Safarian, another important architect, which also comes from the avant-garde. This is the detailed planning developed by Mikhail Mazmanyan uh, of the Yerevan city center. And here you can see what was busy Gebor Kochar after coming back. So Kochar was less involved in the urban planning, but he was much more like the busy with the, as we uh, in Soviet uh, architecture saying, he was busy with volumes, designing the volumes. So one of the resort building, governmental resort uh, that he built in Sevan, it's not far actually from the Sevan Writers Resort. And here you can see the dormitory complex for students in Yerevan, quite different uh, approaches. One dealing with the uh, mass housing, uh, kind of like the trend design, design trend. And the other one was like the continuation of the architects form of uh, former experimentations, specifically with the round buildings. 1960, uh, this is why the very important also building uh, structure, the Seagull Road Mark that was built, designed and built in 1960. And uh, there is a, a bit anecdotic, uh, uh, so to say, uh, story about this building because Khrushchev was supposed to come in 1960 for the celebration of like the uh, anniversary of the Sovietization, 40th uh, anniversary of Sovietization of Armenia, but Khrushchev came in 1961. And the, I think the idea was that to show Khrushchev because he declared like the, that the uh, new arc, uh, the that since uh, uh, since then, like the architecture should like the implement new forms. It should like the, be new. Mod We're not using modernist, but I mean they were the, like using like they should be new architecture. So Armenian architects also decided to show that they are like the in a trend. They are like the uh, also producing a new architecture and. Uh, architect Hovane Sakopian and artist Vanik Khachaturian developed like the uh, a bus station. It's a bus station, in fact, on the northern entry of Yerevan. But uh, when Khrushchev uh, was brought here to see the building, actually the effect was quite the opposite because, I mean, he became completely furious telling like the now I can see how you're squandering people's money, how you're wasting people's money. And he was bringing as an example, this building in every meeting for almost half a year. But in the reality, it's an interesting thing that it was a shifting moment because like the period in between 1955, uh, when Khrushchev announced his uh, policy concerning like the providing every Soviet citizen with the individual living space. So it was like the big project, social project about like the standard prefab housing construction. Architects gradually started, not only in Armenia, but in the other uh, republics as well, started to find out the ways to bypass these quite strict regulations and using the same amount of money or like the combining money from other budget, but to create new forms to make the architecture more interesting. And this was one of these cases. It was a really low budget construction, but which had like the effect positive and, and as we see in Khrushchev's case, quite unexpected negative. 
But uh, starting from the 60s period, the city started to change, not only Yerevan, but also in like the original cities, also the, the, the certain uh, architecture that appeared in the regions, not importantly in, in, in the villages, but sometimes in the landscapes, there were coming up a real pearls of like the modernist architecture of the period that were bearing absolutely different philosophy. The, the space in the city started to uh, get like the really human face. But at the same time, interestingly, it was completely oriented towards like the international modernist style of the period of 50s and the 60s. Here you can see like the implementation of geometrical abstractions, another wonderful example of like the uh, uh, small forms uh, used in the uh, city, uh, city landscapes. Beautiful architecture by uh, not really well known architect, but I mean, researching this architect for quite a long time, Levon Cherkezian. The flower pavilion on Sayat Nova Street. You can see like the exterior, you can see the interior, and you can also see like the one of the variants of this pavilion where the water was flowing down from exterior to interior. And you can see here. It was the same, like the water from the exterior was going into the interior, making this very subtle connection. In, in general, I mean, I mean this uh, idea of like to, to make the architecture much more organic, despite where it was in the city or like the, in the in, in like the uh, wild. Landscape here, you can see, for instance, like the, the project of Levon Cherkesian, it's the cottage hotel on Sevan Lake. And another fabulous, from my point of view, like the example, like the very elegant, very minimalist viewing platform in Sevan. Uh, the connection of like the with the very minimal means of the architecture of the 60s like the connection of the architecture with the natural environment was like the i think uh, one of the important aspects of the history of the architecture of that time the uh, parvana restaurant in Hrazdan canyon by phoenix darpinian and of course the most open air cinema theater. Actually, the text that I have mentioned, uh, the blank zones in the collective memory, it's mainly about this building uh, where I'm talking about the surplus spaces that architecture of 60s was creating. And the surplus spaces, which I named extra territories, extra territories were providing extra potentialities, opening extra views, circle views to the reality. Here you can see the uh, different, different uh, angles from where the cinema theater was like the uh, photographed. Another architecture from that time later, Chess Player House in Yerevan, architect Janna Meshirekova, 1967. And we're getting already to the end of the period. Now, another pearl, which is completely gone, a Café Aragast sale, which was designed as a complex. It was like the very minimalist architecture designed as a part uh, of like the uh, development of the segment of the circular boulevard. The architect, by the way, was uh, a woman architect, very talented, great architect, Margarita Hairapetian. And this is 
one of the images that was really inspiring me writing the text about surplus territories, extra territories in architecture of the 60s. So uh, here, uh, 1965, it was uh, another important moment concerning, like uh, here you can see the photo of the demonstration of student and intelligentsia demanding the recognition of the genocide of Armenians in 1915. It was a crucial moment, actually, from where we can see the shift of the paradigm, the shift of the uh, context. And from here, you can see that the architects, that the ideology of the architecture is being shifted. Still, you can see in 1965, the memorial of the victims of the genocide is referring to the still continuing the uh, visions or uh, like the 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 trends uh, which was quite specific uh, to the philosophy of the architecture of the 60s abstract forms uh, not attached to the uh, any uh, literary narrative but then were confronting absolutely different architecture. 1968, this memorial, which was designed by the same architect who, together Kochar, with Kochar, designed the wine cellars and then the Stalin monument, Rafael Israelian, he designed uh, the memorial complex of Sardarapad battleship. It's a paradoxical, actually, case where in the Soviet time, there was designed a memorial to a historical moment connected to the establishment of the First Republic, because Sardarapat battleship was the battleship after which the First Republic was established. And the effect of this uh, aesthetics, new aesthetics that Israelian brought, had the effect of like the real bomb, because it completely changed the trend. You can since then forget about like the international modernist style. Even certain architects, like one of the co-authors of like the Moscow Open Air Cinema Hall, Telman Gevorkian, he quit for a period his practice and started to really think what he was doing. So he start he went into the researches, he went to like the history and uh, trying to figure out what is the national essence of the architecture, Rafael Israelian. And here you can see the continuation, the extension of like the memorial, the ethnographic museum. I will go quickly, Boris, so I will just uh, show uh, in the blocks. Uh, uh, like the, to uh, just to give the uh, to tell about like the logic, the general logic. So you can see in the project of Rafael Israelian because he somehow got like the new kind of like the brief, the historicism of the beginning of 20th century in Armenian architecture got absolutely new shape, new logic. It was not uh, doing historical references, but it was creating kind of like the architecture, which was like the completely based as Rafael Israel sending on the ground connected with the soil, with the spirit, with the feeling of the nature, the feeling of the uh, materials that were being used in the architecture and specific uh, specific experience, cultural experience. So we're talking now about a specific cultural determinism or essentialism that came not only in architecture, but became a strong part of like the cultural discourse of that period. But the way how the spirit is being uh, represented and through what kind of like the very interesting combinations like the modernism as you can see in the viewing platform offered him as a proposals and the uh, building of the restaurant Sovinar where you can see like the, the somehow 
the certain reference towards like the medieval castle architecture, but at the same time, the complete spirit of like the modernist era of 60s, the, the modernist spirit of the 60s here. That's, a, I think, a very good comparison, like the on the same landscape, two very different modernist buildings in their spirit. But the other interesting aspect of uh, Israelan, it was like the how he was like the really inventing new vernacularity. It was a real modernist approach, completely modernist approach. He was really experimenting and inventing it, not through the researches, but through the just creating it. Oh, uh, this ambiguity actually that came in the architecture and this doubtfulness that the architects experienced in their creations in their experience became uh somehow like the basis like the five five six more minutes what is huh? Uh, and this ambiguity uh, be started to find uh, also like the very, uh, very, uh, so to say, sometimes like the ironic manifestations. For instance, in such a building like the uh, the uh, memorial for the 50th anniversary of Soviet Armenia, where it was designed as a complete, uh, so to say, uh in the in the forms of like the still the international modernist uh visions and uh, thinking but at the same time there coming there it uh, there came like the elements specific elements and on a such an important uh, ideological monument about the 50th anniversary of Sovietization of Armenia. Actually, in the beginning, it was built for like the 50th anniversary of October Revolution. And here the architects started to uh, implement it like they used as a decorative element, different references. For instance, it was like the uh, the um border stones the reference the historicist border stones from urar to kingdom and the artashets uh, uh uh king's uh period it's, uh, which with the inscriptions in aramaic but of course it was like the original here you can see like the, the same shape with the inscriptions dedicated to those who sacrificed their life to the uh, new new social order and the ornamentations the traditional cross stones could not be used on the memorial uh, dedicated to the uh, October Revolution or like the Soviet society but the architects found a way they just uh, transformed uh, the cross stones into floristic ornamentations. Everybody understood that this is not just flowers, but everybody accepted the game. And that, that game, this ambiguity, just penetrated not only the architecture, but I mean the whole mentality of late Soviet society, not only in Armenia, but in the whole Soviet Union. This is like the transformation process, but I mean, I'm switch, I will switch to the important few buildings and that's it. Russia Cinema Theater being considered kind of like as the emblematic uh, uh, modernist building uh, of Armenia, but I'm showing you now the sketch, the first proposal that one of the first proposals that architects came with. So you can see that, I mean, the shapes were, uh, and I mean, this, uh, the, 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 um, actually the first proposal was in its approach quite different from one that came up 
later. And the thing was that, that even the name of the theater, cinema theater, was different. First, they were proposing Noah's Ark, but of course, could not, Noah's Ark can't be used in that period. Then they came up with another thing, with Ayrarat, which was like the, the ancient name of, uh, form of like the calling Urartu, and then connected to the Ararat mountain, and then that was connected like the shape of the cinema theater is somehow being associated with the mountain's shape. But, and you see here like this beautiful, uh, like the, the angles of the uh, beautiful parts, fragments of the building, which was like the completely in a logic of like the brutalism, but, there is one interesting point. The daughter of Artur uh, Tarkhanian once told me in the private talk that when they designed, they completed the building and their father took her to the cinema theater to show it. And he was extremely euphoric and he told to his daughter like that, now you can see what I did, what I built. And they say, yeah, I can see it's a fantastic cinema theater. I said, no, it's a church. It's a church, and you can now, after that, you can really see, I mean, how in the same building, architect was like the really motivated to create something that was going beyond the function that was commissioned by the official ideology. They were not allowed by that time to design the any churches, but I mean, any architect of that period was really somehow thinking or like the dreaming that one day they will have a chance to do that. Youth Palace, another example of like the modernist architecture. And here you can see another, the wedding hall, which is also like the reference to this uh, cleric architecture. Chamber Music Hall, fantastic architecture, Stepan Kyrkchan. And here you can see like the how, what was the evolution of the forms. But this ambiguity uh, of the ideological approaches, uh, the philosophical approaches regarding like the um, uh, architecture and this ambiguity could be represented, could find its place in one building, but also it's finding the place in the practice of the architects, because like the same architect, Stepan Kirchian, at the same time was designing very kind of like the functional in its uh, way of thinking in terms of like the composition, brilliant subway station, uh, Yerita Sardakan. And in terms of ambiguous uh, ideology and philosophy, I think the, the best one is this huge, enormous building, Cascade, uh, with the development of the northern radius of uh, in Yerevan by Jim Torusian. Here it is. So that's the end. I'm still in time, yes? Yes, yes. Uh, uh, I will be quick. Yeah, I think uh, the evolution is very good uh, represented that in, in, the, in your uh, presentation now. Uh, and uh, maybe, maybe the, the, the moment to switch to the contract. Okay, so I'm switching to seven reports from like the story about like the ambiguous uh, transformations. Uh, let's just jump back to the period of 60s. Mikhail Mazmanyan and uh, Gevor Kochar got back. Uh, Kochar came back later in 1960s, uh, 1960, and uh, one of the commissions that he got, he what was like the, the uh, reconstruction of uh, writer's resort that actually they started in 1932, together with Mikhail Mazmanyan. And the resort was built on uh, seven 
island. It was not peninsula by that time. By that time, it was an island. And here you can see the first project that they have suggested for just like the guest house. Here you can see the model. The building started to experience transformations uh, already during the construction phase because it's important uh, to uh, mention the time when it was designed, 1932. I think it's a wrong caption here in terms of like the time. <laughs> 1932, the 1932 uh, when uh, Stalin came out with his uh, famous a uh, decree concerning like the reconfiguration or like the reshaping of like the creative unions, which heralded the beginning of like the Stalinist policy. The, uh, the avant-garde started to get banned, started to get demonized, and uh, the building started to get transformed in the projects and in the construction phases. The same happened to this building. But uh, before going to the transformation, I would like to once again recall you the uh, ideas of avant-garde architects about like the terrace building. So here you can see one of the, again, uh, projects of Masmanyan concerning Kapan, and you can see that he's using here the same terrace concept here. And here is one of the sketch by Masmanyan where you can see like the, the same four specific seven islands. The floor planning of the of the guest house. But here you can see that the realization of the guest house was very different from the initial idea. Here, another moment of like the attempt to transform the building while the architects were in prison in Siberia, there was another group of the architects that in 1955 were commissioned to reshape it into Stalinist aesthetics. Unfortunately, it did not happen. And then uh, new, new uh, context, Khrushchev, uh, Khrushchev is there uh, the Thau period? Uh, Kochad is getting back, and here is the sketch of the general reconstruction where he is like the adding a new terrace to the existing uh, guest house, continuing actually the same logic. But where it is very interesting that the character of the building of 30s is being preserved, uh, but the architecture of the 60s, which has its own specific specificity and its own, so to say, uh, aura, uh, is uh, very harmonically combined, are very harmonically combined. drawings of the guest house and uh, archives. Now I will tell you about, uh, I mean, the, the 2015. 2015, uh, I was connected uh, with the Getty Institution, uh, Antoine Wilmering. Uh, with the offer to participate in the in the competition keeping in modern it was actually the first time when the soviet modernist architecture was going to be included in such a kind of like the important prominent list of like the international modernism architectural pearls monuments and we succeeded and there were big international team working on it. I was the lead uh, of the project in research uh, and uh, we did the project with my colleague who was the lead architect, Sarhat Petrosyan, 
we uh, we brought together like the team of the researchers from Russia. Uh, we were doing developing the CMP in collaboration with uh, Alvaraldo Museum, who uh, gave us a really great help and the consultancy to uh, develop the conservation management plan. And in the frames of the project, we be uh, besides the developing the conservation management plan, we succeeded, uh, we made also the proposal for the restoration, developed the proposal for the restoration, and also organized a big international conference in Yerevan with the participation of the experts uh, from Georgia, from Baltics, from Lithuania, from uh, Boris also participated in this project. Uh, from Croatia, uh, so post-socialist post-socialist countries telling about the experiences of preserving uh, their uh, socialist architectural heritage. Now coming back to the so to say uh, the fields that we actually involved in terms of like the forming the expertise there were expertises in the starting from like the there was a structural expertise there was like the uh, expertise coming from the organization of the hotel business uh, the, uh, like the narrow, narrow, narrow fields, like the uh, from the uh, expertise regarding like the natural landscape. Uh, all these expertises are uh, could be found on the Getty website. Uh, but besides the expertises, actually, we were doing a lot of researches, and one of the researches related to the oral history and the personal archives. Because, for instance, it was very difficult. We we actually collected the possible. The, the I think we've got the whole material photo material, uh, textual material that could have been found not only in the Armenian archives, but also in the archives in different other countries. But there were certain things that, for instance, couldn't be possible just to identify. For instance, the colors, the, the photos were mainly black and white, and the building experienced many transformations and the color, as you know, is something that is being changed a lot. So, I mean, the original color, besides like the uh, inviting the experts of color, who was just uh, like the taking layers of color, reaching like the, the basis of the wood, of the stucco, there were also like the evidence, uh, like the, the 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 witnesses, the members of the families of the writers who spent their childhood there and who were told telling very different stories because the impressions about the color were completely different. I will show you a few images concerning like the shape of the building, and I will focus. Ah, yeah, and there was a very important part, uh, uh, the expertise about like the interior design in two parts, one of the part of 30s and the other of the part of the 60s. And concerning the interior design and furniture, we did our proposal for restoration with the, our colleagues from Bauhaus. So these are some like the images about like the design, uh, interior design for the workers club in the same period of time proposed by the uh, Kochar and Mazmanyan. And here are some shots from the animation. Uh, I have the animation can show you in case if you would like to see it, but uh, I will complete my presentations with the conservation strategies. So uh, we were dealing with the two different periods. One building was designed in 1930s, the other was designed in 1960s. In one building, I mean, uh, you could have only, so to say, the main body of the building because the interiors were transformed many times since the moment it was uh, designed. 
And even during the reconstruction period, the uh, building experienced uh, transmutations and deviations from the project proposed by the architect. Uh, so our idea and the other building was the building of the 60s where more or less, I mean, the original materials, the, even the furniture has been preserved. So we developed kind of like in terms of like the strategies, like, so to say, very, very roughly, I will put it in for the residence hall, for the guest house. To preserve every element preserved from the 1930s, there were just like the few elements, like the one door, one window, to some uh, like the, the metal uh, uh, staircase, uh, some parts of the floor, to ensure solutions that meet modern hospitality and technical requirements. The major problem that the modernist architecture is confronting. It's not a museum. It's not a medieval castle. You cannot close it, lock it. It's the building in function. So it's important how to adapt it to the new needs. To try to redesign internal spaces, including furnishing. So this was the major challenge so to say that we confronted, but we somehow uh, succeeded from my perspective. Uh, now the launch bar. So in launch bar, the, in the launch, not the launch bar, sorry, the, in the launch, in the, in the canteen, the uh, challenges were like the, the, the uh, it were less because I, as I said, like a lot of things get preserved. To restore and to reuse the structure, which retained its original condition, almost without any impairment to its original design solutions. The next thing about like the landscape, a very also important part, because I mean, the island is the like the part of like the national seven park. So, I mean, we should be like the, as delicate uh, in the case of like the environment as with the case of like the restoration of the building. And the final thing were the challenges. The cha challenges concern, uh, related to the sustainability, as I mentioned, surrounding landscape, amenities, which, or pools, I mean, this is not true. And the accessibility was another challenge because, like the it's the resort is located on a quite steep hill, and interior design and furniture. So, if I have time, I can go with the video. Here we go. Can you, can you see it now? Okay, so uh, the animation shows you like the, the evolution of the building since it was built. Now you will see it. And the proposals actually for the reconstruction we're coming with. So it's much easier to take a look. Okay, that's the location. And here you can see like the proposal 1932 and how it was realized in 1935. So deviations. The proposal of 1963 and 64. and how it was realized with what kind of like the deviations and our main point was just to go to the proposals of the architects that were by this or that reasons were not completed and this was something that we discussed a lot with our colleagues. And if you remember, Boris, it was our final discussion on spot where we were like the, with this whole 
group we, from Getty Foundation, from Alvaralto Museum, and our team were like the talking about like the how to uh, as a approach for the restoration. Uh, just to uh, somehow bypass the uh, given by the history reality that we're confronting now and go back to the ideas offered by the architects. The pool was also, uh, the swimming pool was also in the uh, initial idea of the architect that did not happen in the reconstruction of 1963. And here it became a crucial issue because uh, the level of the lake is uh, going year after year up. And for 19, uh, for sorry, for 2035, I mean, the altitude of the lake surface should be quite high, which means that the launch will, uh, the, the resort won't have a beach any longer. So here you can see that we got back also to the initial planning, the space organization, because now the spaces are completely changed. I mean, sometimes you are having like the two rooms turned into one room uh, with a horrible planning and the horrible design. So uh, the idea is to get back to the initial uh, principle of the spatial organization. So this is also quite kind of like the, the animation offers like the rough uh, <laughs> images of like the furniture that we've been uh, like developing together with our colleagues, uh, colleagues uh, from Bauhaus. And as you see, even in the uh, building, which has like the, so to say, two layers, one layer belongs to like the 30s, the other layer belongs to the 60s, the furniture is also mixed. So there is like the furniture newly built, but actually like the continuing, like the replicating the principles of like the functionalist furniture of that period of time but not the fake with it's not a vintage it's a new furniture so we're not faking it and at the same time like the furniture which can be like the original uh, which could be found the furniture from the 60s okay so this is like the launch part concerning the uh uh the uh structural aspect of the building luckily we okay here we go that's it luckily the final word luckily our building is in a very good structural condition in terms of like the uh, uh, the the concrete is in a very good shape we made a very uh scrupulous structural assessment and it needs just they the the our experts proposed also uh, like the uh, uh, some ways to do the reinforcement of the building but uh we're in that terms we're on the safe side thank you
Foundations keeping it modern uh, program or initiative uh, was supporting only the development of conservation management plan. So, uh, in the frames of our funding, we did uh, actually extra two things. One thing was like the, the development of the proposal for the restoration. And we did also like the scientific conference. But uh, the main 
task of the founder is just to get the conservation management plan. It, it was like the quite uh, interesting experience for us because I would say that in the uh, Soviet and in a post-Soviet even uh, professional circles, and then actually I figured out that we are not alone in that, uh, the sometimes the restoration uh, approach uh, is being proposed first, then the conservation management plan comes as the second phase. Well, I mean, in the uh, in our uh, working experience with uh, Getty Foundation, which was not only funding us, but also like the, was really helpful in their expertises in their consultancy and uh, they support it a lot during the process uh, one thing that we learned it was like that the conservation management plan comes first and on the basis on the conservation management plan the restoration proposal comes out that was something very new actually for us but um uh, the project has been finished and the CMP is there, the uh, restoration proposal is there, time to time we talk to Antoine Wilmering, the director, the former director of Keeping Kid Modern Initiative, but with that the relation with the funder is over because they funded the development of CMP and that's it. Concerning the future of the project, I mean, it's one of the emblematic buildings. It already has kind of like the, the stamp, approval stamp from Getty Foundation. But what will happen with the physical restoration, it's still a question for us. Because after that, we confronted revolution, then we had war in 2020 there was also covid period many things i mean now there is like the big uh, geopolitical turbulence in in a region connected with the war in ukraine nobody knows how the things will develop who will be the next the who will be the possible investor and the question is would they use the question is, would they use the uh, CMP and the uh, restoration proposal offered by us? Because the building still is the property of the Union of Writers, and they are looking for a partner. They are looking for the partner who would invest uh in the reconstruction of the building so they could continue to run it that's a big problem for us now i did uh, the idea is to switch to uh next uh, presentation and after maybe we will have a common discussion uh with uh, and, uh so uh, thank you Thank you very much, Mr. Bantamkan. And now we will switch to Unical Antichi, uh, one of the very notable uh, architectural historians and uh, art uh, historians uh, in the um, PDC in Georgia. Uh, she um, uh, was the founder and creator of uh, GeoCare's Architectural Project focusing on the study of Soviet architecture in Georgia in general and Tbilisi in particular. Her experience helped a team of Tbilisi scholars and architects to include one of Tbilisi's modern, modern buildings, Palace of Chess, in the Gate Institute program in modern. Uh, working on this project, Nishimura was responsible for historical research and uh, she was uh, also the team coordinator. And among the other project uh, of me, I would also note the study and preservation of Soviet mosaics uh, among 
sometimes which are the particularly diverse uh, and the interesting forms uh, uh, in this country. Uh, me is a well known uh, scholar and lecturer who has given lectures and talks in many countries. Uh, last time we met the American Weimar last year during the conference of the institutional approach in architectural studies of Soviet communism. And me, you are very welcome to our seminar. Uh, the floor is yours. Now, yes. Thank you very much, and hello everybody, and also congratulations on the exhibition, and thanks for inviting uh, to this talk. I should just make very short remark that uh, for the uh, Keeping It Modern project with the Chess Palace, I was not the project coordinator. I was just responsible for the research, but I will also come to this uh, topic later. Uh, I will share my presentation. So uh, the topic uh, of our lecture today is, I mean, as mentioned, late Soviet or late socialist modernism, Georgia. And uh, uh, there will be also quite some references and links to what uh, Ruben has uh, talked about. So I'm sure we will have uh, regarding this also maybe interesting uh, discussion afterwards. Uh, so, um, uh, before coming to 1960s, I want to make a very short overview of what was preceding it. And I will be mostly speaking about Tbilisi, uh, capital of Georgia. Uh, before 1920s, the appearance of Tbilisi was mainly shaped by international architects from Germany, Italy, Poland, Russia, and so on. In 1921, uh, Russian Red Army, ed, uh, Army entered uh, Georgia. The Social Democratic government had to uh, flee and consecutively a Bolshevik uh, regime was uh, established. Sorry, sorry, it was too fast. Uh, yes. So obviously, Tbilisi's present spatial structure is a product of a long historical process and development. Cities' territorial expansion mostly occurred during Soviet times. Uh, between 1921 and 1991, Tbilisi expanded six times in terms of population and ten times in terms of uh, incorporated territory. Uh, capital city develop, uh, developed according to three uh, master plans, in, uh, first in 1934, uh, second in 1952, and the third in 1970. The first master plan mainly concentrated on reconstruction and improvement of existing areas, as well as planning of new housing estates next to building new residential houses. New type of architectural construction, such as worker clubs, kindergartens, cultural uh, institutions, recreational parks, found its entry in uh, Tbilisi. The second master plan considered expansion of Tbilisi and building new streets, avenues, and the market mainly along the river from uh, east uh, to west, so mainly um, like on this territory. In 1950s, it's predominantly characterized by mastering free territories for new mass housing areas. The third master plan introduced in uh, 1970 was foreseen city development not only along the river, but its expansion towards north, towards Tbilisi Sea, so basically all these uh, territories. And was concentrated on city's economic and social development. So basically all buildings I will be mentioning today in the presentation were built shortly before and after the introduction of the third master plan, which was designed to last until uh, year 2000. Tbilisi was growing fast. Uh, in 1960s, a uh, number of Tbilisi population reached 1 million, which was a precondition in Soviet republics to introduce metro lines. Um, so Tbilisi metro uh, was the fourth uh, metro in Soviet Union after Moscow, St. Petersburg, uh, and Kiev. And it has two lines. The first line opened in 1966 uh, and the second in 1978. In 2000, two extra um, stations were added to one of the existing lines. 
So the development of the socialist architecture of Tbilisi and Georgia had a very diversified character. One can say that almost the entire period it was searching for a national or Georgian style. Starting from 1920s, when constructivist architecture was slowly emerging, there were many cases of formally adjusting national forms to it. This was mostly expressed uh, through the use of towers traditional to the mountainous regions, elements of medieval architecture and stylized pointed arcs. Uh, art historian Vahdan Beridze described this tendency as a nationalization of constructivism. Um, architectural education in Georgia was also possible in, um, in the time period, like in tw uh, 1922, from 1922 on. Uh, and from the very beginning, it became important to study Georgian uh, church architecture or Georgian medieval architecture, also interesting to what Ruben was uh, saying. So taking measurements, drawing sketches, et cetera, it was like very important part of uh, um, uh, studying architecture in situ for making the, um, uh, to going out and study all this uh, medieval architecture. And it was then that the tendency to use national heritage in creating new socialist architecture noticeably emerged in the work of Georgian uh, architects. In 1926, the Soviet Georgian newspaper Communists uh, reported that uh, the uh, executive uh, committee of the city of Tbilisi has recently adopted a Northwest resolution that would dictate the appearance of the city's architecture. Uh, it said, uh, so I quote, from now on, every building in the city must be designed and built according to the Georgian civil architectural style. Facets of important buildings in the city must be adjusted to the Georgian style. This resolution of the executive committee considers giving a national appearance to the city and restoring the Georgian architectural style. End of the quote. So uh, from 1930s, uh, socialist realism, which was forced by Stalin throughout the entire Soviet Union, promoted the Georgian style even more. And national elements were constructed in every field of art throughout the entire 1930s. There is a continuous process of uh, cultivating national symbols for every Soviet nation and uh, nationality. So national dances, music, the literary canon, pantheons and uh, new historical narratives are being constructed uh, in that period. And just in in 20 years, this abundant decoration and nationalism um, reform was harshly criticized in Khrushchev's uh, resolution um, uh, on the elimination of redundancy in design and construction issued in 1955. So Khrushchev was uh, the General Secretary of Soviet Union after Stalin. And in this resolution, he criticized the excessive use of decorative elements that gave buildings an archaic look and essentially prohibited any decoration that impeded cost effectiveness. So Khrushchev was not concerned much about the style and appearance uh, of the buildings and uh, architecture, but, but rather practical matters in order to promote rapid construction processes uh, in the cities. Uh, introducing industrial construction methods and working out started designs, developing and utilizing new build uh, building materials, uh, first, uh, foremost, supported acceleration and improvement of the housing construction processes. Residential houses, entire districts uh, were intensively built by using precast reinforced concrete and prefabricated panels. Uh, certainly, public buildings were of great importance um, as well. Uh, and, uh, but in this case, architects had more freedom in the designing process and individual projects were prioritized. When designing public uh, buildings, architects were able to fully express or, or they had much more freedom to create, to express their creative freedom, which was not the case for massively constructed housing blocks. Uh, and so I want to start my presentation with uh, one of the uh, earliest examples of the transitional period from uh, Stalin era uh, to socialist modernism, so-called uh, wedding house. It is interesting because it stands right opposite to a building built in 1955. And the other one was built in 1960, only five years after Khrushchev's above-mentioned uh, resolution. 
Uh, uh, so we definitely have to pay attention to the scale and shape of the building, how it takes reference uh, to the bu building opposite to it uh, um, and the shapes. Uh, so it has almost a similar distribution of floors, uh, division uh, of ground public floor uh, and upper residential um, apartment floors, also the um, uh, the shape of the building with the slightly uh, front set uh, middle part and the wings which go on the side. Uh, so um, I find it very interesting how uh, the architects of the later constructed building uh, uh, respect and um, pay attention to the uh, kind of uh, urban development or the visual development mm -hmm. or the cohesion of the square. And they stand, uh, as I said, they stand uh, in front of each other, these two buildings. Um, the vertical um, uh, division of the buildings uh, building is marked with rows of a precast uh, ornament resembling uh, grapes. Uh, the part of the wedding house, which is placed in the ground, fall, uh, ground floor, is more richly decorated. Uh, so the entrance was marked with a large scale bar relief uh, of a family. Uh, it is um, a hybrid clearly featuring Georgian national symbols, grape, wine, elements of national uh, costumes, uh, but simultaneously also representing a family of a working class with a sickle in the hand. Um, uh, yeah, um, and uh, also the forms, they are rather this very strong, uh, um, uh, emphasizing the shape of the body of the worker class, which is also quite typical for the later uh, socialist period. Uh, also to mention the interior, it was very typical 60s design with minimalistic and uh, clear forms. But again, uh, interesting that the shape of the table with slightly trapezoidal horizontal arms um, references with the dedabodzi, which is a central wooden column in the Georgian traditional houses. So this is uh, the dedabodzi. Um, uh, uh, and um, uh, the Stedabodzi is on its part is considered as a holy place, as a symbol of life and foundation of a family. So also interesting uh, how they translate uh, the um, elements and symbols from the medieval architecture in the uh, modernist forms. The next uh, example I want to show uh, is the Tbilisi Sports Palace uh, from the same period, uh, built um, uh, starting in late 50s and finished in uh, 1961. The exterior of the building is exceptionally minimal, so the facade with the main motive of a strong uh, five-arched arcade with archivolts surrounding the building as a deep passage from its three sides. Uh, the lightness and refinement uh, are additionally created by continuous horizontal uh, glass line with three rows uh, on the top of the building, um, located above the arcade and ends with a cornice. Um, uh, the uh, so uh, this horizontal line of windows has not only decorative structure uh, or function, it is the source of natural light for the interior galleries surrounding the main hall on the upper level, so which are uh, behind these uh, three rows of uh, windows. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, last year, when Anna Bronovitskaya was giving her lecture in the frame of the, uh, this lecture series, uh, she mentioned in her presentation that in Soviet uh, times, if buildings constructed in uh, republics exceeded certain scale, it was to be agreed with the center in Moscow. So in order to avoid this bureaucracy, authors of Sports Palace found the solution to put uh, the half of the building underground. And by entering, uh, so what you see now in the form, so this kind of walk type uh, of uh, shape, the half, it's basically, so this part is all underground. So on the ground level, you see just uh, from up to, from this part on. 
Um, and by entering the building, it strikes uh, really with the volume which is not expected because of uh, exactly the reason which I mentioned. Uh, and one of the most significant characteristics of the building is its roof, a thin sloping precast concrete dome membrane, which is made without supporting constructions. It was the first of its kind in the Soviet Union. Um, so before using it in the sports palace, the construction was tested several times to guarantee its uh, stability, uh, of course. Uh, in the case of Sports Palace, authors, um, so the architects and engineers, so they created um, an assembled membrane over a 76 to 76 uh, meter hole. The roof uh, has slabs in 10 concentric circles that decrease in size going uh, upwards, and amount and size of slabs decrease in relation to this. Each cell has a segment uh, for the placement of reinforced concrete uh, slabs. So they basically go into each other. So here you can see very well how the structure, um, how, um, uh, how was the technology of putting uh, the rows into each other. Um, so installation uh, continuing for 22 days. Um, so actually quite fast. Uh, uh, and um, the engineer, David Kajaya, obtained a copyright for the construction and installation method uh, for this uh, membrane, which was very innovative uh, back then. And I'm pretty sure that the inspiration for uh, Tbilisi Sports Palace came from Nervi Sports Palace, but it also uh, um, it, it, it has to be mentioned that uh, domed roofs and thin shell structures uh, hyperbolic paraboloids, uh, as well as exhibition pavilions and sports facilities of uh, similar structures are quite intensively featured in the magazine uh, Architectura SSSR, uh, Architecture of uh, USSR, which was one of the main sources of information from architects of that time. Um, and um, what I also find uh, very interesting is this transition from the Stalin architecture to modernist uh, features. Uh, so these two buildings which I show, they are built by the same architect, uh, Lando Alexei Meskishvili, and both buildings were um, uh, finished, uh, their construction was finished uh, in the same year, 1961. Um, but the difference is the year of their commission. So the lower one, which is uh, former sanatorium Imereti in Tspaltubo, uh, was commissioned in 1948. And the upper one, the sports palace, as I said, it was commissioned in 1956. Uh, so it was, again, uh, one is before the Khrushchev's resolution, so it's still starting period, and the other one is uh, right after the resolution. Uh, and I find it very interesting how the... Um, architects uh, manage this uh, quite uh, rapid or harsh transition from one uh, very or, or between these two very different stylistically very different um, uh, periods and uh, um, requirements, uh, but uh, and what I also find uh, these parallels, uh, which are like these domed roofs or the round uh, shapes and the arched galleries, I find it very interesting how they are translated in the modernist forms. Uh, so, as I already uh, said, majority of the buildings built by individual projects are for public use and institutional buildings. Uh, so, we encounter very few residential houses built with individual design. Uh, we already mentioned in the beginning that the great attention was uh, paid to improving housing conditions. Uh, a special decree on the development of housing construction in the USSR was adopted in 1957, and it aimed to reach a significant increase in uh, housing at the shortest possible time. So architects um, had to create a standard design uh, for the most affordable housing with low ceiling, without elevator and garbage chutes, but definitely with plumbing uh, and bathrooms. They had to create an apartment that um, apartment type uh, that would have been in accordance with industrial construction methods. 
uh, from the pen perspective, this new economical apartment was supposed to be for a family and differ from a communal unit. Uh, uh, and five-story panel uh, buildings, mostly known as Khrushchevkas, uh, became the basis for mass construction in the USSR. Uh, but at the same time, the Soviet Union was equally successful in implementing double standards. Uh, houses built uh, according to individual projects were not um, that much exception for the members of the Central, Com uh, Com uh, Central Committee of the Communist Party and the Council of Ministers of the USSR, and for other people having special uh, positions or achievements uh, um, within the system. One of such houses uh, stands in the middle of Tbilisi at the entrance or at the edge of a park. Uh, its initiator was a composer, Alexei Machavariani, famous for his ballet Othello, which got popular not only union-wise, but also internationally. Um, I'm afraid to make a mistake here, but he apparently got a very important acknowledgement also from Italy, golden medal from a Brad Dance National Library, if I remember it correctly. Uh, and there is a long uh, story behind the medal, but what matters is that he was a highly celebrated uh, elite uh, member with connections to a party and decision makers who could give him a green light to building a non-ordinary house initiated by a cooperative of private people. Um, where every family got uh, quite spacious and uh, generously planned uh, apartment on each floor. So um, there were just only four families living in this house, one on each floor. And the uh, Alexei Machavariani himself, he got two floors. It was also interesting because he, as an artist, uh, so uh, the um, uh, justification was that one floor was for living and another was uh, his uh, workshop or studio. So this was quite also um, exceptional or like nobody could afford uh, having two floor apartments in uh, Soviet uh um, reality, so to say. Uh, and what I also find interesting with this building that it was planned by um, Majavariani's wife, um, uh, though this is uh, the only building that she realized. And uh, uh, why I also find it particularly interesting because in Soviet uh, Georgia, we have really, really few uh, very few names uh, of women architects uh, who were the uh, leaders uh, of the project. So, of, of course, there were many uh, women also studying and graduating, uh, graduating from architectural faculty, but they were basically the um, uh, members of the collective and they did not have the leading position. So, um, this I find it also very interesting. Uh, another uh, very interesting but totally different example of housing for the workers of the Institute of Cybernetics uh, in uh, on the rather outskirts of Tbilisi in, uh, um, so to say, uh, like in uh, micro rayons um, uh, on a hilly terrain. And it's distinguishable because of its idea behind the concept. So to take the inspiration from the mountainous uh, regions of Georgia. And also this is very interesting to what Ruben said with the um, architecture taking into consideration the landscape and building this terrace type uh, of building, uh, which is also very uh, typical uh, um, for Georgian reality and from Georgian mountainous regions where the towers and dwelling units distributed on the slopes are all connected with each other either by outer or uh, inner corridors. Uh -huh. And uh, since we talk about mountainous regions, I want to make a short excursion from uh, Tbilisi. In 1971, the decree on improving housing and living conditions of people in the mountainous regions uh, or villages of uh, um, uh, Georgia was adopted by the Central Committee. Uh, the emphasis was placed uh, on the tourism potential of the mountains. In the 1972 to, to, to 75, uh, 
plan for building the villages in these mountainous ranges of Georgia, Pshav Chesureti, was uh, approved uh, shortly uh, after the decree was uh, issued. Uh, and besides building residential houses, the task was uh, to include the construction of schools and teachers' houses, household uh, service facilities, medical units, and other build, uh, buildings. So basically, um, to uh, develop the infrastructure also in the mountainous regions, which are quite uh, still to nowadays. Uh, uh, there are several mountainous regions which are cut off during winter time from the center of the country. So uh, this um, decree and the plan also um, uh, foresaw the uh, development of this region, so infrastructural development, as I said. Um, so sets of residential houses with two floors and uh, four rooms was uh, designed and uh, the plan took into account uh, compact settlements typical of these mountainous regions. So the slope of the terrain uh, also here determined the terrace placement of the houses and they are arranged uh, in groups and follow the um, uh, landscape. Uh, they face uh, south and overlook the road which enters the village um, and continue on the slope. Uh, so uh, here uh, in the lower image you see uh, so the summer kitchens uh, and wash houses uh, um, where um, so like the front was rather living area then uh, behind there are uh, summer kitchens and wash houses houses and also uh, cow sheds uh, located on the terraces behind the apartments uh, and the, uh, uh, with flat roofs which is also very typical uh, for these regions and uh, with the use of local uh, shale stone um, uh, they try to preserve the look of the village and help it blend with uh, the um, environment with, uh, where it's set in. Architects also uh, considered uh, planning quite spacious distribution of rooms, which was uh, also not very typ typical for the vernacular architecture, where uh, the whole family members uh, uh, with cattle would live basically in one room, especially in the winter time. So, in order to guarantee also the warmth, uh, the warmth efficiency. Uh, and what we see in this new proposal is that uh, there is a clear functional division between rooms. It's very spacious. There are many rooms uh, planned. Um, uh, and as far as I know, the settlement uh, still exists, but it would be really interesting for me to know how successful uh, in reality this project was and if such kind of uh, comfortable housing really became practical for the inhabitants of these houses. Um, so, um, while talking about nationalization of modernism in Georgia, we can uh, not not mention Viktor Jorbenadze, Georgian architect whose work perhaps uh, best uh, embodies the late Soviet experiment in creating an architectural style that was uh, modernist and innovative and socialist and uh, fully Georgian in a way. Um, so he developed an inter uh, he quite quickly developed an interest in the Soviet Union's secular brand of ritual architecture, a genre that um, permitted extensive formal creativity. His projects um, uh, or they, um, these projects challenged architects to imbue life rituals with a sense of continuity with Georgian traditions. Um, for this Mohadguer the cemetery complex design, uh, inspiration definitely came, or it's obvious that it came from Corbusier's from Champ Chapel. Uh, but Jorbenadze's works are, and his works are also characterized with plasticity, with which he definitely marked his style among Georgian architects. Uh, uh, so Mohadguerdi provides uh, quite an early uh, glimpse of the idiom. Uh, Jorbenadze would later employ at his masterpiece, The Palace of Rituals, which I come uh, right after, um, and especially in these cultural forms and postmodern technique of incorporating historical uh, elements. Uh, uh, 
um, as a form of citation. In one of the buildings, uh, he literally embedded historical uh, tombstones onto the um, facade of the building. So in 1980, um, uh, Giorbenadze built a palace of rituals to replace the more utilitarian uh, wedding registration offices that had become the norm in the 1960s. Uh, his design uh, incorporated and in, uh, still incorporates elements of Georgian church architecture. So the frescoes, a bell tower, tower traditional roofing uh, are all uh, presented in uh, this building. The form of the building itself is laden with symbolism speaking to the union uh, of female and male. Uh, very interesting uh, architecture and when state committee, by the presentation of the building, by the official presentation of the building, uh, um, when the state committee uh, present there, which was, uh, was quite surprised and they objected the building, uh, but the first secretary back then, Eduardo Chevarnadze, personally defended uh, Giorgio, uh, Giorgio Benadze's use of ecclesiastical and traditional motifs as an acceptable um, interpretation of uh, Soviet design formula, um, national in form and socialist in uh, content. Uh, and uh, the building became also uh, quite celebrated, where also Margaret Thatcher was welcomed and uh, um, lots of famous people would be welcomed, giving also like um, uh, giving uh, festivities and uh, lots of um, official meetings uh, taking place in this um, building. Uh, and, uh, of course, uh, I cannot also uh, skip and not talk about uh, one of the, probably the most um, uh, uh, famous, uh, so I would say without exaggeration, uh, the most famous uh, building uh, from um, Georgia of the, so of the um, Soviet period. It's the former Ministry of Automobile Roads by Georgi Chakhava. Uh, the building uh, has been compared to various projects speculating uh, on its origin and inspiration, such as the Ireal City by Hidegel or Lysitsky's uh, Horizontal Skyscrapers. But most closely, Chakhava's uh, idea came uh, come to metabolists that cities and buildings are not static elements, but are ever-changing. And Chahava also envisioned his building to be uh, growing, but it uh, never came true, unfortunately. Uh, and Chahava himself was always stressing that his inspiration came from the nature and from forest and uh, tree trunks. So he wanted the building to take as, le as least possible uh, space uh, on the ground and develop basically uh, upwards and uh, like tree trunks to go uh, into the um, sky or into the air. Uh, an interesting detail that maybe also contributes to understanding the functioning of the Soviet system is that for the project built uh, in uh, republics, there was a limit set by central government. So without Moscow's permission, officially, it was only possible to realize a project with a budget that did not exceed uh, 3 million, uh, million rubles. Uh, it's no wonder that also for this project, the budget uh, for the whole building was much higher than 3 million. Um, so the solution um, they found was to distribute uh, the budget among uh, different departments and institutions involved in the project because the building was, uh, uh, it was not only the Ministry of Automobile Roads, but it was also several attached to the ministry institutions or the sub uh, departments. Uh, so they um, found the solution to distribute the budget among uh, different departments uh, and uh, also uh, all involved um, kind of trusts and uh, building companies. They some contributed with the material um, and so on. See, so and as I have heard uh, from other projects, also this method was not uh, exceptional. So uh, the republics or the architectural institutions 
they always tried uh, to solve these problems uh, locally in order not to have this burden or pressure to um, agree every detail with the center in Moscow. Uh, so already in 1970s, the building received a lot of international response, of which Georgi Chakhava was very proud. He was most happy about the fact that in 1981, the building uh, not only was presented in the exhibition Transformation in Modern Architecture at MoMA in New York, but also appeared in the accompanying publication. However, uh, it is uh, the only building that uh, appears without mentioning the names of its authors. Uh, just a few years later, a letter and a copy of the publication reached uh, uh, Chakhava, and it turned out that official bodies in Moscow approached with inquiries about the building in Tbilisi from MoMA's side did not provide any information, so they did not respond, basically. Uh, and probably the uh, probably the center did not like the fact that building the building uh, built in the Peripheral Republic uh, attracted such an attention of the international uh, audience. Um, um, so, um, sorry. Uh, and um, if uh, before the ministry uh, building, Chakhava was building in other republics of Soviet Union, uh, after uh, the ministry, he never ever was allowed to build something of a bigger scale than the bus uh, pavilions. So this was basically the punishment uh, from uh, the center in Moscow to the such dared uh, project. Uh, and with this image, since I mentioned that Chakhava was uh, working also internationally, uh, I included image of uh, the uh, Tashkent uh, bus station, uh, since this uh, lecture is also organized within the, the framework of uh, Tashkent modernism. Uh, this Tashkent um, bus station uh, called Samarkand uh, station was built in 1964. Unfortunately, um, there is very, very few uh, material available um, on the building. So basically there is no textual material. We have several images and some floor plans. Um, and I was also um, communicating with Boris about this building, but uh, unfortunately we could not find any further material. So this very beautiful building is also um, gone. Um, and as I mentioned, um, that Chakhava was only building the small pavilions. Um, uh, these are uh, these uh, bus uh, talks or bus pavilions on the territory of the breakaway region of Abkhazia, um, uh, with which we uh, or it's a disputed territory uh, with uh, between Georgia and Abkhazia. Um, and these pavilions deserve to be mentioned uh, in particular. So in recent years, numerous photo books have been uh, dedicated to the architecture of bus stops in the former Soviet Union, and they have been lot, uh, uh, photographed a lot. Um, uh, and this uh, bus structure or, or, or these structures scattered along the Black Sea coast in Abkhazia are um, particularly noteworthy because as far as I know, nothing comparable to, to them has been created in Soviet Union uh, either before or uh, since. Uh, so uh, these uh, functional pavilions, uh, obstinial structures indicate also the engineering and artistic uh, mastery of their authors and prove uh, the high quality of these mosaics. Uh, Moreover, that none of them repeats the shape uh, of the others. And even though they, all of them have uh, names such as like uh, shell, elephant, cat, octopus, and so on, their forms are rather abstract and uh, biomorphic. Um, uh, based on an interview with one of the collaborators of Georgi Chakhava, Goga Beridze, he mentioned that uh, after his trip to Italy, Chakhava was so much impressed by uh, Nervi's architecture and technology developed by him that he wanted to establish in, uh, uh, it also in Georgia and was looking for projects that would have been uh, unusual architecture. So and pavilions in Abkhazia are um, 
uh, kind of um, witnesses of this uh, or examples of this unusual uh, architecture. Uh, unfortunately, all these uh, pavilions, they have lost their function and they are abandoned. So uh, very, very few of them, they are still um, used uh, by their original function. And um, since uh, Georgia or Georgians have no access uh, to uh, territory in Abkhazia and we cannot really uh, take care of these monuments, uh, it would be really a real shame uh, to keep neglecting them and lose them as um, weather and time will ultimately do their job. So it would be really, really urgent to take some steps in preservation of these uh, small pavilions. Um, so, and here I want to start also talking about the situation since the 90s. Um uh, uh, so after the fall of the Soviet Union and reestablishment of Georgia's independence, many institutes uh, um, and uh, like uh, similarly to Ministry of Automobile uh, Roads, they uh, stopped to function. And this building is also very uh, exemplary to all the processes uh, which Georgian went uh, through from 90s on. Um, so a building of this size could also no longer be sustained and institution, institutions that were still functioning, uh, they had to move uh, out. And for years, the building stood empty and was abandoned for years. Uh, in 2007, um, uh, the building was granted the status of an immovable monument of cultural heritage. And uh, until now, it is uh, one of the very few buildings from the late modernist period in Tbilisi that has been granted uh, the status. We have uh, literally only four buildings uh, uh, from that period in Tbilisi that are uh, granted the status. Uh, and in the same year, in 2007, uh, one of the major banks, the Bank of Georgia, uh, privatized the building of the former ministry. And the construction project was uh, um, developed uh, and um, um, uh, they, um, they developed uh, on consultations with Zurab Jalahanya, who was the co-architect uh, of the building, and luckily uh, he's still alive So for consultations, and he was very much, uh, very intensively involved in the whole process. And we have to say that certainly the preservation of a building of this scale would, uh, have, uh, would not have been possible uh, without the commitment of large institutions, and the bank was probably the best case in terms of uh, financial possibilities. Um, uh, and um, uh, also, um, just very, very short overview of the problematics of the preservation of the um, uh, architecture of this uh, period before I come to the final example I will show the Tbilisi Chess Palace and uh, Alpine Club. So the problem we encounter in preservation of modernist architecture is um, a very complex one, uh, whether on international or on local level. So the greatest threat to the architecture of um, basically any epoch, but uh, any totalitarian epoch, of course, it's also its perception of their ideology. Uh, and the perception of the previous period by the next period is often very reactive and to a certain extent also very negative. And it needs a uh, certain time to take a distance and uh, have a rather uh, sober look uh, at it. And most of the countries that uh, formed the socialist uh, bloc and the Soviet Union tried to quickly forget the ideology of the past uh, after regaining uh, independence. Uh, and the easiest and fastest uh, way was to erase it and their elimination from their visual memory. Conse uh, so, and consequ uh, consequently, also many buildings or structures were sacrificed to this very first emotional impulse. Um, which was called independence or liberation from the pressure of the past. Um, so um, the building I'm showing here, it's a um, uh, former, uh, um, it's so-called Andropov's Ears, uh, the party tribune in front of which official parades would take place. 
and um, uh, starting from uh, late 90s it took almost 50 years to demolish uh, it and another five or more years the plot was vacant until the uh, restaurant which uh, was built where they would um, uh, basically sentimentalize the very past they have destroyed uh, so uh, after the construction of this restaurant the interior was um, decorated with uh, some uh, uh, historical or archival images depicting the very tribune that they have uh, um, demolished. Um, so I find it also very interesting, uh, this uh, um, so-called return of the repressed. Uh, so um, one cannot uh, definitely, uh, one cannot erase the past that easily as we want uh, it. Um, uh, also, uh, the build, um, we have um, one of the problems for the buildings of that period uh, with administrative or cultural were um, that they were designed for masses. Uh, and the main problem encountered by the present day society is their maintenance or preservation is their large volume. Uh, after the destruction uh, or um, the fall of the socialist regime, the transition to a market economy for the states having all these buildings uh, on their balance, it became impossible. So one of the central and primary, uh, primary problem has become their provision with uh, utility services. It was impossible to supply such uh, volume um, of electricity, gas or water at the expense of the state. Uh, in many cases, the solution was found in the, um, uh, in the sale to private owners, uh, which applies also to this building. I'm showing this is uh, uh, Olympic living, uh, swimming complex, so-called beautiful example also of the 70s architecture. Um, and I uh, intentionally put these two images um, on top of each other to see the original, uh, opened uh, in the beginning of 70s and then uh, the development it uh, uh, also faced um, like the urban development how it uh, surrounded the building and kind of uh, uh, created a gate of residential houses this arch standing uh, which uh, absolutely disturbs its uh, um, uh, perception uh, of the uh, of this building. Um, um, so, and um, as I said, uh, the um, solution was uh, in privatization of these uh, buildings, which also uh, applies to this building. The uh, owner uh, is a private fund, which is also associated with. Uh, uh, one of the richest, uh, or not one of the, but the richest men in Georgia, Vizina Ivanishvili, which also stands behind the ruling uh, uh, party. So, and uh, for years now, this building has been uh, vacant and uh, it has been used as the uh, parking uh, for uh, auto repair services. And then in 2016, there was a big flood in Georgia, which also affected the building. And you see how the grass is growing. Uh, from the swimming pools and um, uh, it's still uh, there is still no real plan of uh, returning the building uh, to its original function or any other plans of um, doing anything out of this place and it's a real shame that the building is this beautiful building is uh, in such a condition uh, so, uh, I'm coming to the last part of my presentation, uh, the last uh, e example, as I promised, uh, it's uh, Tbilisi Chess Palace, uh, an Alpine Club building to study and preservation of which I have dedicated uh, almost uh, five or seven years uh, now. And it's interesting because it illustrates almost every challenge I have uh, talked about now and serves as a mirror to political, economic, social changes uh, in the country. The building offer referred to as the Chess Palace was dedicated to two particular women. Um, 
One is five-time uh, world chess champion, uh, Grandmaster Nona Gaprindashvili, and uh, the other one is a mountaineer, Alexandra Japaritze. Um, uh, architects uh, faced a very interesting task uh, and a number of challenges. A garden with a sloped terrain was uh, selected as a location and functionally the building had to uh, accommodate two types of sports, alpinism and uh, chess. The building stands um, out not only for its architectural mastery, but also for its urban uh, planning. It is not characterized by large dimensions and does not uh, dominate the rest of the public space. Uh, the distribution of the floors follows the landscape also here. Uh, on the eastern uh, side, the building um, has three floors and um, on the and, and from the west it has two floors uh, glass windows and doors uh, in aluminium frames divide the facade of the building covered with local uh, limestone of beige uh, um, color uh, the facade is a simple uh, it's very simple and restrained and it's a play of uh, horizontal and vertical uh, lines uh, and the division of the function between two owners is sold also very logically and is marked clearly. The Alpine Club, um, uh, so this is basically the uh, floor of the Alpine Club, uh, is situated on the basement floor uh, of the building on the eastern side, as I said, and has an individual uh, entrance. Uh, uh, besides it, uh, Alpinism uh, or the Mountaineers Club, it, um, uh, there were administrative premises and sanitary units. There was also a small hall serving as an auditorium, museum, and a canteen with an open terrace uh, at the disposal uh, of the mountainers. And on the uh, first and second floors, the building is uh, uh, encircled with balconies which provided the freedom of movement around the building. So one could go around uh, the, like uh, 360 degrees, one could uh, go around the buildings and there were also staircases connecting the two, to, uh, two floor uh, balconies uh, with uh, each other. Uh, the core of the building uh, is its main uh, hall uh, for 520 visitors. Its shape is similar to an oval amphitheater and has a stage uh, elevated um, or at an elevation of five floors uh, or five steps. Uh, a very interesting and innovative decision was uh, made regarding also an additional natural light system and also the natural uh, air ventilation, uh, ventilation system. Um, uh, and uh, additionally also to increase the amount of uh, audience in the hall. On the level of the third floor, um, uh, the hall is uh, bordered by side galleries which connect uh, to it through six mobile panels. So you see here um, on the one side three and on the other they were like uh, mirrored also three and you see here uh, they are in an uplifted condition. So these uh, panels could be uh, lifted uh, up and uh, they allowed more people to view chess tournament, tournaments and as I said also provided uh, natural light in the hall located at the center of the building which had only the secondary um, uh, light. Uh, and very special mentioning uh, deserves the selection of the material for these panels and the technique of execution, uh, so-called marketry, a type of combining uh, wood pieces which has never been very popular in uh, Georgia. And this is a very uh, well sought parallel to a chessboard uh, that, uh, where the surface of which is also assembled with uh, wood pieces. And it's um, literally very same technique uh, which is used on the chessboard and later on the panels of this um, uh, of the side galleries. Uh, uh, the, luckily, uh, the panels are preserved in their original shape. Uh, the mobile system does not function as it has not been used for more than 30 years now. Uh, and there are slight uh, damages visible on the surface, but uh, they are uh, not really profound. 
In its uh, lifetime, the building went through a lot of uh, transformation. So in 1970s uh, and in 1980s, it found fame and admirers and respect. It was uh, really filled with uh, 520 and even more sometimes spectators who were watching the tournaments um, in very silent uh, mode. Um, but uh, after the fall of the Soviet Union, and one should also mention here that from 90s on, Georgia went through a lot of transformations and um, political and economical up and downs. And uh, this is also when uh, this building started to break to pieces for uh, various functions. So in different times, there was a, a casino, a burger place, a pharmacy, a bank, uh, a gym uh, accommodated under its roof. Uh, today we have um, the following situation that uh, building belongs to Tbilisi municipality and is leased to Georgian Chess Federation with uh, 85% and to Mountaineer, Mountaineers Club uh, with 30%. Uh, and in order to maintain um, uh, itself and the building, the Chess Federation needs to rent out uh, parts of the building. Uh, so the rent, uh, there are spaces currently, it's rented to a billiard club on the first and second floors. Uh, additionally, there is a cafe, uh, International Chess Academy, which is separate from the Chess uh, Federation and uh, office uh, of the president of the European Chess uh, Union. Um, and why I also uh, put such an emphasis on this, because uh, both current and former tenants uh, adjust the uh, building uh, according to their needs uh, and uh, taste. So making inner spaces larger and creating new spaces by uh, using uh, balconies and staircases um, or sealing the windows and putting doors, uh, uh, which are... Um, more beautiful airports, of course, than the original ones. Um, uh, and these uh, um, tenants are completely neglecting the site and setting and architecture and construction materials and design of the original building. So in the entire um, building, there are several um, decorative elements and paints of different color, um, that are fundamentally inharmonious with the original material and the concept of the building. Uh, uh, and architect's initial challenge and finding creating architectural form corresponding to its idea and function has been uh, sacrificed to a uh, very utilitarian uh, function. But, of course, in our conservation uh, plan, besides giving recommendations on how to revert building to original appearance by removing separation walls and reverting to original floor pattern, uh, it is uh, a mandatory paying attention to cladding and finishing, plastering uh, and uh, railing materials. Uh, um, it is also important paying attention to increasing the energy efficiency as the old the central heating system is not functioning anymore and windows with aluminium profile frames are not sufficiently insulated anymore. Um, and energy efficiency um, recommendation implies also the installation of modern lightning system by gradually replacing technically obsolete lamps and arranging modern lightning uh, management and monitoring systems. But by doing so, it's very important uh, adapting old lighting system design to modern technologies, of course. Um, and big emphasis is put on the adaptive reuse of parts of the building and especially of the main hall as the largest and currently most uh, non-functional space. Uh, so uh, our recommendation is to equip it with modern technologies without infringing its uh, uniform artistic appearance uh, and to renew the seats to make them more functional, make extendable, um, expandable stage in order to fulfill current requirements of the Chess Federation while uh, making the whole uh, multifunctional. So our idea was uh, to make the um, uh, whole uh, 
um, so uh, from the both sides. So not only that the chess federation could use it for the tournament, but also that the whole could generate uh, additional income for the uh, owners of the building. And uh, with this, they don't have to rent out the additional spaces of the vestibules and side galleries and so on. And um, uh, with this to revert them to original uh, um, floor plan. Uh, so, and our uh, recommendation also implied uh, um, arranging uh, waiting areas for the parents uh, who bring their children both to uh, Mountaineer Club and Chess Federation because they <coughs> there is no waiting uh, area for parents and they have to wait for their kids um, in the park. And this is not the most comfortable place, especially in the cold seasons and especially in the rain. Also to arrange a thematic cafe and gift shop uh, to equip the um, bouldering room of the Alpine Club with um, new equipment. Um, uh, yes. And of course, all these requirements are based on a uh, sociological survey, economic uh, analysis and uh, market research, which was part uh, or preceding the conservation and management plan uh, or the study of the building. Uh, so the document we have prepared contains um, building's historical overview, its context and significance. A uh, comprehensive description of the original design with archival material. Um, uh, then this part is followed by current condition assessment with history of changes over the years and identification of damages and their factors. And um, uh, the third part is followed by conservation principles and policies and recommendations for management. And finally, all the studies that have been done in order to prepare the conservation and management plan, which is the structural survey of the building, inspection of mechanical systems, study of the building materials, uh, recommendations on improve, improving occupational uh, safety, a uh, sociological survey and recommendations for increasing the energy efficiency of the building, as I mentioned. Uh, so this uh, detailed management and conservation plan is accessible on the project website, which is Chess Palace and Alpine Club written together, as well as on the um, website of the Keeping It Modern uh, site. Uh, um, and the document was submitted to the building's owner, Tbilisi Municipality, in 2020. But until now, there has been no move to implement our recommendations. Uh, of course, uh, we have to take in consideration that starting from 2020, the pandemic, of course, um, uh, uh, prevented it and uh, also um, as in Armenia's or um, uh, writer's house, uh, also war in Ukraine is a um, big um, prevent a big um, uh, problem in uh, uh, in going on with the uh, conservation of the building, and there are a lot of factors which uh, prevent us from this. Uh, but uh, still, uh, I wanted to finish uh, my presentation um, on a positive note, and I wanted to give some uh, promising examples. In 2022, there was a big retrospective exhibition organized, uh, dedicated to Lado Alexi Meshishvili, the architect of the um, Chess Palace and Alpine Club. Um, uh, and not only big number of interested audience, but especially of a young generation, made me particularly happy and uh, hopeful. Um, the exhibition showed the original drawings, sketches, uh, found in state and private uh, archives and in a family, uh, complemented with archival photo material, ephemerals and videos. There were also models uh, of quite uh, um, many buildings, um, 
made uh, so people could visualize buildings in their original form as currently uh, some of them are demolished or modified to the extent that original is not recognizable anymore. And there were also videos documenting current state uh, of the existing one. And uh, so, as I said, uh, the exhibition had uh, quite a huge uh, response and we also organized uh, thematic tours and workshops during the exhibition. And now, uh, from Tbilisi, where it lasted uh, four months, the exhibition, it went to another city, uh, the second biggest city in Georgia, which is Kutaisi, and is um, presented uh, there. Uh, and why I'm mentioning it also, because uh, these kind of exhibitions are very important uh, for uh, raising awareness and for talking about this period architecture and also to um, uh, make understandable the values uh, uh, of this architecture and why we should be fighting for uh, their preservation. And uh, as a final note, um, uh, I am presenting a publication um, initiated by Goethe Institute in Georgia uh, and as a part of a moving exhibition, City of Tomorrow, uh, which is curated by Ruben uh, in uh, collaboration with Georg Schollhammer. Uh, and it was also supposed to take place. So this is uh, kind of this traveling exhibition where um, which has a core exhibition and in every country um, they travel, there is a local extension to this exhibition. And it was also supposed to happen in Georgia, but unfortunately, again, pandemic uh, prevented us from uh, doing the exhibition. Uh, and we decided to um, have a, a publication format. Uh, and as a result, this um, uh, publication uh, titled Building Socialist Georgia was published, uh, which for the first time unfolded uh, to now hidden chapters of the history of architecture and urbanism uh, in the country from 1920s to 1980s. Um, and this book is not uh, really focusing on the already canonized work of star architects, but instead gives thematic insight and puts works uh, not only in architectural, but also in political and uh, geographical uh, contexts. Uh, unfortunately, the book does not have an inter uh, international distribution, but uh, a copy is kept at the Biblioteca de Maxi in Rome. So if there is an uh, interest, um, uh, yeah, so this is accessible and I was very happy that uh, Maxi was um, agreeing and willing to have a copy of it in their library. So um, yes, this is it. Uh, I hope uh, I'm in time uh, and uh, it was, um, yeah. Thank you very much for your patience and attention and I'm also happy to answer your questions. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I think we have a very uh, interesting uh, presentation and uh, now the field of the lesson. Um, maybe we can just ask. Well, thank you very much for the brilliant presentation. Again, great history and presentation, in fact, we just respect it. So. Many thanks, really. Uh, for another question, also. Um, and also, <clears throat> a number of thoughts looking at so how many things we can come with these experiences, which grow in different contexts, but with very similar, I would say, results, but very similar issues that have been taken by the different groups involved in this program. Uh, for another question, for we regard the, the two factions which were originally and till now also in the palace, uh, so the chess players and the uh, fight club, 
very interesting and so this interest me since I was bad artist and an even an even worse chess player, <laughs> I call it bad. My son is better than me, luckily. Um, so I was thinking uh, how and if they could sit together about this is just a joke. Um, I think it is interesting in both your experience the fact that the building continued the original uh, use for what it was conceived, which is a condition uh, when, when the opposite occurs, which should be a source of risk for the building, since the new use, even if adaptive, are always threatening uh, uh, the integrity of the building. And what is surprising is that, in your case, the continuity of the use seems not to be an insurance for the preservation. Uh, and I don't know if you want to comment it further, even thinking to how and if you manage to involve not just the owner, but also the user of this mm -hmm. Yes, very, very uh, complex uh, question indeed. Uh, uh, so, um, uh, definitely, luckily, the building is still uh, municipal and is still with the original function, which is Alpinism and uh, Chess uh, Federation, on which I can also comment later why these two uh, sports uh, were come together. Um, because, as I also uh, mentioned previously, the big um, uh, problem is when the building is privatized because it becomes even more difficult to put it on the monument list, which is almost imp impossible. And uh, you also cannot guarantee that the new owners will continue preserving it uh, in the original um if not function, at least with the original appearance. And there is also the problem in uh, Georgian legislation that while um, selling the building, uh, there is no mentioning that the new owners have to um, maintain the original uh, appearance of the building. So basically the new owners, they are uh, free to do whatever they want with the building. Uh, and in this uh, case, uh, we call ourselves la um, luckily uh, that the building is, uh, was still uh, municipal. Uh, but uh, this understanding of the value of these period buildings is almost non-existent. It is still very much uh, considered to be and seen to be Soviet. And always when uh, argumenting uh, for their preservation, I'm using that it's from Soviet period and not really Soviet because uh, also what we saw, like, uh, of course, we did not elaborate much on the international uh, parallels of these period buildings, but they go uh, hand in hand and uh, in parallel with the um, uh, modernist tendencies in the West and the other countries. So it's always important to use this argument when we talk about preservation. And uh, But of course, it needs a lot of um, uh, educational uh, meetings, talks, discussions, uh, uh, to make them understand uh, the value of the building. So I can say that uh, during uh, six years uh, of my engagement with the Chess Federation, uh, uh, we slightly came forward. So we are not in the very best, uh, and that's also why I mentioned that while we were working on the conservation and management plan, they were still continuing the renovation works. But, uh, for example, recently um, uh, the uh, members of the Georgian, uh, Georgian National Committee of the Blue Shield, which was the initiator and uh, basically also mediator between um, uh, me and restorers and others and the Chess Federation, they were approached and asked uh, if uh, there could be a meeting. So I, we don't know exactly what uh, the plan is from the Chess Federation, because the meeting has not been yet, but uh, at least they came to the point that they want to consider their opinion, at least. Uh, 
so this is already a good step. And also there was uh, recently a jubileum of Nona Kaprindashvili, this grandmaster chess player, which I mentioned. And for um, uh, her uh, jubilee, I was approached again to contribute with the visual material of the historical appearance of the building. So apparently now they are also proud of the building they have. So this really makes me hopeful that uh, we have uh, come a little bit uh, farther in our uh, um, yeah, the educational work or to make them understand that the building is valuable and they have to take better care of it. It was just an open question about the involvement of the ownership and the user of the building in the process, thinking to preservation like a long term process, not something which happened in a while. I have to say that one of the uh, good aspects of the ownership that this ownership has been the same since 1935. That's important. I mean, uh, that's perhaps the oldest uh, existing uh, working, I would say, like the uh, ownership, I mean, the oldest property that uh, since the very beginning uh, of the establishment of the Union of Writers, the resort was the in ownership of the union. Uh, luckily, uh, the union did not uh, did not sell or privatized or just uh, get rid of that building. Uh, during the project, the union was quite helpful, uh, but. At this stage, I already mentioned, I mean, they uh, are interested in keeping the building, but they are interested in the uh, actively exploiting the building. That's the issue. Uh, so on one hand, there is, there is also one thing that uh, I did not mention that uh, after we completed the project, and this is coincided also with the revolution that took place in 2018, uh, and uh, uh, long-lasting uh, civic movements uh, that were oriented to uh, uh, fighting for like the preservation of like the architectural uh, heritage. Uh, so, in 2018, after the revolution, uh, the resort was listed, finally listed as a historical monument. But uh, there is still no guarantee that our proposal for the restoration and the CMP is going to be used. Because they are looking for the investor. The Union of Writers is looking for the investor. And unfortunately, we could not find there was one investor. But at a certain point, I mean, because of the war, because of the other circumstances, uh, that investor refused to invest in that initiative, though she was like very much interested. Uh, now they found one. I don't know how it will go on. Uh, for now, they say that uh, they are going to follow our recommendations. They are going to follow the proposal, but I'm not uh, really sure about it. And concerning concerning like the question that the uh, building is listed as a cultural monument, because I mean, usually the procedure it goes like this. I mean, if there is uh, the proposal for the restoration concerning the historical moment, uh, monument, it's going to go through a, a specific uh, examination by a commission. 
methodological scientific methodological commission uh but even in that case there is no guarantee that the commission is going the jury is going uh, kind of like to defend our proposal it's the business issue thank you uh, i have this just uh, just addition but to the question when it was listed uh, it was described what is uh, protected and uh, what is uh, free for uh, some changes. Uh, what means uh, to be in the list of national heritage? In Georgia too, it's also it's, uh, the question to um, Honestly saying, uh, it does not specify what is going to be protected or not. I mean, it gives like a very general kind of like the status concerning the protection. But uh, I mean, we had already an experience in 2000, uh, in 2000, in the beginning of 2000, I don't remember exactly what was the date when like the a mm, uh, great number of uh, the buildings which were listed during the Soviet time as the monuments were taken out all of a sudden from the list because this was the uh, beginning of like the intensive gentrification of Yerevan. But there's these were only the first steps. Then it turned into like the huge scandal uh then after the revolution because like the in between there was like the uh, serious like the uh, civil movement uh, activist movement uh, protecting the cultural heritage and i mean it's uh, not just like an activist issue the protection of like the cultural heritage uh, turned uh, before the revolution into a serious political political uh, issue and a political tool also. So after the revolution, it was listed, but how it's going to work, I have already described. I mean, it's not clear at all. Um, well, it's, it's very similar in Georgia. Unfortunately, uh, monument status, uh, when, when giving a immovable cultural monument status to a certain building, there is no uh, particular specification how this one particular building should be treated. So it's rather a general uh, um, uh, regulations which as i also said it's mainly about appearance of the building and absolutely not taking into consideration uh, interior design furniture design or any other design elements and uh, also this um, uh, exterior appearance also uh, there is no detailed description what is to be uh, uh, paid attention to and be taken into consideration. So, um, and monument status, I mean, it's just, uh, <coughs> um, unfortunately, um, uh, this monument status, if there is uh, a big uh, commercial interest from a real uh, estate side or private investor side, this monument status can be also taken away. But it's just for us, um, I guess, uh, people who deal uh, and uh, fight for the preservation of this period architecture is just one um, step more or one tool more when we fight for their preservation. Sure, thanks for your talk. That was very interesting um, for me that I would love to learn about Sofia and Paris. Yeah. Project. And uh, since this last question about uh, listing uh, uh, the heritage, the Soviet heritage, I was wondering something um, about Georgia because I know that in 2011, uh, uh, I think, it 
was up here with Ed Newell, uh, and Newell, and talked to him about the food bomb, uh, that uh, he really ban was banned the, the symbol of the uh, police appear. So I was wondering uh, what's happening uh, before this, uh, this uh, approval and then if in the legislation uh, uh, there was some uh, initiative uh, uh, preventing and uh, uh, preserving uh, this heritage. Well, you are right. It was around this period, I think 2011, uh, when uh, this um, law was issued on banning the Soviet symbols from the public uh, space. But in Georgia, it was mainly um, concerning hammer and sickle and uh, the monuments of the Soviet leaders, so like Lenin, Stalin, uh, and so on. Um, but even in this, uh, they were quite uh, non-consecutively um, uh, uh, following because not everywhere the hammers and sickles and uh, statues were uh, removed. Of course, from the bigger cities and from the main squares, uh, like we have no more um, Stalin or Lenin or Marx and Engels standing in the uh, in Tbilisi, but for example, Stalin is still standing. Uh, Stalin statue, not Stalin, luckily. Uh, Stalin statue is still uh, standing in his birth town Gori, and not only, like in some smaller cities. And uh, the same goes uh, for hammer and sickle. For example, there is uh, one particular bridge in Tbilisi. Uh, which uh, on this uh, balustrades, uh, I mean, it's a huge precast uh, iron balustrades and it has hammer and sickle in it. So I guess uh, removing um, the railings, it would have been so expensive that it was not worth it. So they left it. Um, yeah, so also in these terms, they are quite... Uh, um, twofold or um, not very consequently uh, following uh, their own uh, charters and the laws uh, uh, issued. And luckily, these did not uh, um, did not concern, uh, for example, Soviet period mosaics, because uh, since we are talking about this charter, it was crucial in Ukraine and some other republics when they introduced this law to destroy uh, Soviet period mosaics, which were uh, also featuring uh, the Soviet symbols, uh, which uh, luckily uh, was not the case in Georgia, because on the one hand, we did not have that many hammer and sickles in the mosaics, uh, and um, nobody really also cared, I guess, that period about the mosaic. So as I said, it was mainly on the big public buildings and bigger, uh, more prominent public squares and streets. Maybe, maybe uh, I have a last question about the uncertain uh, We know that uh, specific technology in which uh, uh, don't happen uh, didn't happen in, in other countries uh, like uh, rating terraces uh, or uh, use parts and uh, in, uh, what is interesting uh, the appearance of this uh, type of building and it seems uh, to me that uh, uh, use parts in the area Uh, 
That's a very interesting question, Boris. Uh, that is true. I mean, certain typologies uh, were realized, like the youth palace in Yerevan or the wedding palace in Georgia, for instance, like we did not at the wedding palace, but I mean, I showed to you during the presentation that somehow like the wedding big uh, kind of like the whole uh, ceremonial hall was integrated into uh, into the youth palace and over there the architects actually again uh, kind of like the started to uh, play uh, with the uh, with the uh, with the history, like the or like the integrating, like the, the interior of church into like the completely modernist building. Uh, so it's it's a it's a it's a actually the uh, uh, issue which uh, deals with the uh, ambiguities which were very specific to the late Soviet and uh, period in the uh, collective thinking and the cultural understandings of the uh, uh, collective understandings. Uh, but uh, there is uh, an important issue related also to the political circumstances. For instance, one of the important typologies that did not uh, appear in uh, Yerevan it was like the Lenin Museum, you know, you remember, like in the late period of time, I mean, the 70s and especially in 80s, in many capitals, the Lenin Museums turned into like the enormous temples, uh, which in their scales, like they're really representing like the, 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 the the uh, the late uh, Brezhnev period decline, uh, and uh, this on a certain moment, I mean, uh, the political nomenclature in Yerevan somehow somehow uh, prevented the appearance of the museum. Besides the museum, there was also another case concerning the Russian theater. Till today, the architects uh, of that generation, they say like the, like the society was stupid. I mean, the, the, they started like the, to talk against it. Who cares if it would have been like the Russian theater or if it would be a Lenin uh, museum, it was money that coming from Moscow, we would have used it, we would build it, and now we would use it as uh, for a different function. But we should consider that the situation in uh, Armenia and Georgia in the late 70s and 80s was quite different from, for instance, different republic. E each republic had kind of like the distinct uh like the histories in the specific period but 1975 1976 it's an important period when uh in soviet union and in national republics there was the last wave of the uh state political line uh which was connected with the Russification. And in Tbilisi, uh, in 1976, if I'm not wrong, uh, there were like the uh, wave of like the uh, demonstrations against this Russification wh when the Russian should have been adopted as a state language. So there was a strong resistance in Tbilisi. In Yerevan, the demonstrations did not happen, but there was like a, a very strong resistance and actually uh, the local political nomenclature uh, actually understood it and warned Moscow that it would be better not to touch that issue. So this was creating a background and on this background, uh, certain typologies, they did not 
they weren't realized. As a, as a continuation, maybe I should also add that there was also in uh, Tbilisi a Lenin Museum plant, but luckily it never got realized. So it was already end of 80s when they were working on the plants and there was a competition and there were several uh, uh, entries to this competition and there was also, um, if I'm not mistaken, a winning project, but it never came to realization for which I'm also very, very happy because it would have been um, this very typical, from the typological point of view, this huge cube, already brutalist, massive uh, building on the in the center of the city, on the edge of the old part. So it would have dominated and uh, basically swallowed the uh, um, adjo adjusting uh, small streets of it. So it never came to realization. And as for the wedding palaces, uh, mm, Actually, Tbilisi's one was quite a late one, as it was already mid-80s. Uh, uh, but as far as I know, this was quite a common phenomenon in Soviet Union, exactly because of uh, replacing the church and the religious uh, topic in the Soviet Union. So these new palaces of rituals or the wedding palace, uh, palaces in uh, different republics, they were called uh, the either name. So... Um, uh, they, um, I mean, I know, of course, Felicity. I have been uh, in the one in Almaty, which is also very much having uh, this uh, bearing symbols from the um, typical church architecture or uh, like the frescoes and the arrangement. Uh, and this was very conscious um, decision, I guess, to uh, creating this bridge, so not fully to... Uh, make this drastic cut with the religion and the church, but to implement these small symbols to um, uh, have this smooth continuation. It's really great. Uh, okay, thank, you, yeah. thank you very much. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, organizers uh, sent me back to the cut to finish because of the uh, conditions. It uh, was a great pleasure to see you on the Wow. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And good luck and enjoy the Good luck and congrats. Yeah. Thank you so much for my side. Let's get in touch soon for the next seminars. Thank you. See you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.